Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Patient-Centered Care with, with an Ostomy in Assisted Living and Personal Care Facilities. I'm Wendy Johnson with the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. PHCA offers monthly webinars to members to receive updates from department staff on regulations, learn from industry experts on current trends and practices, and to gain a better understanding of practical application tools to equip you so that you may continue to provide the highest level of quality care possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the PHCA website. The webinar has been approved for one continuing education credit for PHCA members. Credits will be uploaded to NAB within the next two weeks for those of you who have provided us with your unique NAB number, and I will be sending attendance certificates. A survey will be launched at the close of today's uh, webinar. Your feedback is important to us and our presenters, so please take a moment to complete the survey. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. However, throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit your question using the questions pane on the right hand of your screen, and our presenters will address them at the end of today's presentation. I'll now turn the webinar over to Janine Gleba, who will introduce today's presenters. Thank you, Wendy, and the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association for this opportunity to present patient-centered care with an ostomy in assisted living and personal care facilities. We welcome and appreciate everyone in the audience for taking time out of their busy schedule for this education. Again, my name is Janine Gleba, and I'm the Advocacy Manager at United Ostomy Associations of America. UOAA is a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote quality of life for people with ostomies and continent diversions through information, support, advocacy, and collaboration. We've partnered with the WOCN Society, the Wound Ostomy and Continence Nurses Society, who is a professional community dedicated to advancing the practice and delivery of expert health care to individuals with wound, ostomy, and continence care needs. They support their members' practice through advocacy, education, and research. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing today's speakers, who are two amazing nurses and advocates for their patients. Sue Muller has been a nurse and a nurse case manager for many years. She has had a colostomy since 2004, and since that time has been very active with UOAA support groups. Sue became a certified wound ostomy continence nurse in 2009 and has worked in hospital and home care settings, as well as private ostomy consulting. She recently retired, but she is still very active with UOAA on the advocacy committee, where she has helped us for five years and currently serves as one of our committee co-chairs. Kate Lawrence is a clinical nurse specialist certified in wound ostomy and continence care. Her clinical practice setting currently is home care for the VNA and hospice of the Southwest region of Vermont. She also is a consultant for extended care facilities and assisted living centers in the state of Vermont. She is a past president of the Wound Ostomy and Continence Nurses Society and currently sits as the WOCN Society's public policy and advocacy coordinator. Next slide, please. Today, by the end of the webinar, each attendee will be able to define the purpose and function of an ostomy, recognize that general maintenance care of an ostomy is similar to the tasks of toileting assistance under activities of daily living and personal care services as defined by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Lastly, you'll be able to describe how to incorporate the components of ostomy care into an individual service plan. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna have Kate take it over. Good morning. Thank you all so very much for joining us today. We started this journey of exploration around access to care at assisted living facilities because of patient stories. Patients with ostomies or their families sought out the United Ostomy Association and subsequently the Wound Ostomy and Continence Nursing Society due to troubling consequences. I'll give you some scenarios. A daughter whose father had fallen and fractured his hip had been to a subacute rehab, the, the father had, but was then not able to go to assisted living due to a previously placed ostomy. The second scenario, a wife whose husband had a stroke, a CVA, 
But then after discharge from the facilities, the subacute was not able to return home with her due to an ostomy, which was actually a previous surgery because of the perception that he had increased needs related to his stroke and an ostomy. And third, a patient who was diagnosed with cancer um, had an ostomy uh, in the hospital, had recuperated well, lived in an apartment in a continuous care retirement community, which included assisted living components, and was unable to return home due to this new ostomy. These stories were very concerning to us. And we decided that we needed to know more about this to advocate for these types of patients. We explored the regulations in the states where there were uh, where these cases had occurred. And we quickly learned that each state has variable regulations, as you probably well know. In some states, there was just an openness, no regulations, no questions about ostomies. But in other states, ostomies were put in the same category as tube feedings and um, patients with ventilators. And there were restrictions and requirements and, and needs for waivers to have those individuals return to assisted living. This was a problem to us because we do not perceive that having an ostomy is anything like being on a ventilator. I think that's fairly obvious. So we reached out to the American Healthcare Association who directed us to the state-based network used for assisted living. And that's how we found you folks in Pennsylvania. We subsequently shared our frequently asked questions document to all 50 states in hopes of helping patients gain admission and to retain their residency in assisted living facilities. Where people live does matter and access to care <clears throat> um, matters even more. And we're hoping today that we can share information with you to help on this cause. Next slide, please. And this is going to be Sue. Thank you, Kate. Ostomies seem strange and even a bit mysterious, but they are actually just a change in a person's plumbing. Technically, an ostomy is a surgically created diversion for the elimination of body waste. Picture the digestive tract as a long, flexible pipe, the mouth at one end, the rectum at the other. As you can see, there are many parts of the digestive tract, and they all have a job to do. Digestion starts from the first bite of food. The food moves from the mouth down the esophagus into the stomach, each section adding something to the process. When the food moves into the small intestine, the digestive enzyme added and nutrients absorbed. The food mass is very liquid. When the food reaches the large intestine, it starts to become less liquid as water is absorbed. And when it reaches the rectum, ideally it is a formed mass. When an ostomy is created, the intestine is diverted to an opening on the abdomen and a stoma is created. This is a picture of a stoma. It is actually the end of the intestine, which is turned inside out and attached to the abdomen. It is pink and red because it is a living tissue. It is mucous membrane like the inside of your mouth. Change the slide, please. There are three common types of ostomies. Two are fecal, where the output is intestinal waste. One is urinary, where the output is urine. An ileostomy is created when the ileum part of the small intestine is diverted. Because the ileostomy is formed from the ileum section of the small intestine, the food mass is very liquid and contains many digestive enzymes. This ostomy must be emptied after each meal and the output is corrosive to the skin. A colostomy is created from the diversion of the large intestine, which is the colon. Because the food mass is almost at the end of the intestine, the output is more formed. This ostomy has to be emptied less frequently and the stool is not corrosive. The urinary system also fits into the plumbing analogy. The kidneys make urine and the ureters act as pipes, delivering the urine to the bladder where it is stored until it travels out of the bladder and the body by the urethra. A urostomy is needed if the bladder needs to be removed or bypassed. 
the surgeons create a diversion using a piece of intestine which they attach to the ureters on one end and attach to the abdomen on the other, forming a stoma. The urine then flows from the kidneys down the ureters through the intestinal piece and out the stoma. Urostomies need to be emptied the most frequently because the urine is not stored in the intestinal piece. It just provides a conduit. Why is an ostomy needed? Um, for cancer, for inflammatory bowel disease, birth defects, trauma and accident, diver diverticular disease. Um, next slide, please. In Pennsylvania, there are resources through the Living Independence for the Elderly program for people who live in assisted living. They can receive health and home care services. In Pennsylvania also, elderly people who qualify for nursing home care from Medicaid may choose assisted living and utilize the support of the home and community-based services waiver. Next slide, please. In Pennsylvania, having an ostomy does not exclude a person from admission or retention in an assisted living residence. So it's not on the exclusion list. Assisted living residences are tasked with providing assistance or supervision with activities of daily living and instrumental ADLs. Ostomy care is an activity of daily living. The good news is that in Pennsylvania, an assisted living residence can arrange or provide supplemental healthcare services such as hospice, skilled nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral health, and home health. So if an ostomate has additional uh, needs, they, they have the resources available. Next slide, please. We would like to dispel the, some of the myths that surround ostomies. Some people believe that all people with ostomies have an odor. We think the origin of that myth was from the original ostomy pouches that were made of black rubber and actually absorbed odors. Today, pouches are odor resistant, disposable, and come with charcoal filters. Another myth is that ostomy pouches frequently leak. Accidents happen, as with all people, but they are not the norm. When a properly fitted pouching system is in place, there will not be odor or leaks. An, ost an ostomy is not a wound. As you saw from the stoma picture, it has a red-pink color, but resembles the mucous membrane in the mouth more than a wound. Ostomy care does not require a sterile procedure. Changing an ostomy pouch is not at all like an invasive procedure. CMS defines invasive procedure as an operative procedure when skin, tissue, or mucous membranes are cut or an instrument is placed in a body opening. And that is not what happens with ostomy care. Change the slide, please, and Kate will pick up. So now we're going to address some frequently asked questions that we've run against. Does emptying or changing an ostomy pouch require continuous nursing care or skilled care? Absolutely not. Ostomy pouches may require emptying numerous times during a 24-hour period, depending on whether it is formed uh, bowel movements, watery bowel movements, or urine, as Susan just described. But they do not, individuals do not require skilled care or continuous management to uh, manage those emptying periods. An ostomy or a pouching system may need a complete change, the whole system containing the effluent, maybe one to three times a week. This is also not a complex medical procedure. And the process of changing a pouch is very individualized per each person and usually does include a number of steps. However, once a routine is established and the patient has been instructed or a caregiver has been instructed, the pouching system is not a skilled activity. Now, there are some components of assessment 
But over a long-term period of time, patients and their caregivers also learn this component, and we will speak a little more about this. Next slide, please. So how do you categorize daily management of an ostomy? Well, in fact, everyday management of an ostomy is, is, is a <clears throat> activity of daily living, as we noted before, and really is comparative to a non -pers a person who does not have an ostomy with toileting activities. So we compare the management of an ostomy situation the same as toileting with an individual who does not have a diversion. Next, please. Now to make sure we completely understood this issue, as there are states that have fairly restrictive and perhaps uninformed regulations, we went to the, the source. We went to Medicare and Medicaid and CMS and we looked at those definitions. And as you can see, custodial care is when non-skilled personnel help with activities of daily living and or personal needs and things that can be done safely and reasonably without professional skills or training. In other words, activities of daily living. Next slide, please. CMS further defines continuous nursing care. Continuous nursing care is around the clock care used only during periods of crisis at home to achieve palliation or management of acute medical symptoms. Next slide, please. And the definition by CMS of skilled care is the type of healthcare when skilled nursing or rehabilitation is needed to manage, observe, and evaluate care. Any service that can be safely done by a non-medical person without the supervision of a nurse is not considered skilled care, which you see activities of daily living and toileting are not skilled care. So you don't need a nursing super, you do not need nursing supervision to empty or change a pouch as we have uh, underlined. Next slide, please. So CMS, thankfully for our belief system, also defines that ostomy maintenance is a personal care service. So the regulation states that individuals that need personal care services are included, uh, but not limited to general maintenance care of a colostomy and ileostomy. And I think inherently they do not speak about urostomies here, but it is um, within the same um, perspective. Next slide, please. So you ask, I imagine, when actually does ostomy care require skilled nursing care? And so we wanted to kind of talk about um, these elements, uh, again, to uh, provide um, more information, education, and assurance. When an individual has a new ostomy, there is initial education and evaluation for what kind of pouching system they may need, what works best, and that is a post-operative assessment. That would include some skilled nursing care. It is done within the hospital. It can be done um, in subacute care, uh, rehab care, and outpatient care. It also is done by home health nurses in home health nursing. So if there are issues that need adjustment, further education, that is a skilled mix of care, specifically by CMS. They, they want those um, items to be done in, within the right setting, and it is a, it is a skilled and paid um, activity. If there are ongoing or continuous or new uh, sudden peristomal skin problems, and patients are educated, that is what I do every day, part of my job is educate patients on what are peristomal skin problems, what should they be looking for, and at what level uh, can they treat it themselves, and at what level do they need to seek uh, assistance from a wound ostomy continence nurse or a physician? When the pouching system that they wear requires reevaluation because all of a sudden it's not working anymore. As our bodies change, as we gain weight or lose weight, 
as different things happen to us, we get the tummy bug, perhaps the pouching system that the individual has no longer works. And if it's a consistent problem, that needs reevaluation by someone at a different level of care. To get the patient back into the correct pouching system, make sure their skin is maintained and healthy, and uh, that they can continue living quality of life without any pouching problems. When a person has a knowledge deficit regarding their diet or hydration, so perhaps they have a change in new, they have a new in addition chronic disease that all of a sudden comes into their life and they need extra education regarding uh, proper uh, food that they can eat with an ostomy with this new disease process, or if they perhaps get something and they're dehydrated all the time. So education, for example, on how to hydrate uh, if it's a if, if it's a hot summer, et cetera. These types of uh, advanced educational moments um, perhaps would need some sort of skilled nursing care. Our belief, and, and it's, it's demonstrated for the last uh, 60 years, that if you have the right products in, in place um, for the right person, then they can live a full and happy life without having a lot of intricate needs, a lot of advanced uh, medical intervention uh, as long as uh, you know they know how to take care of themselves and that's the educational process and that's what would be skilled. By the time they come back to their home that will have been reintegrated into their lifestyle. So ostomies do not need to be placed in long-term care facilities um, for an ostomy. Um, we believe they belong home where they belong. Next slide. So let me address a couple of things about when people with an ostomy might seek actual medical assistance. Now, I want to put this in the framework that um, many of these symptoms are things that individuals who have no ostomy would be also having for some of the same circumstances and would be seeking medical assistance. So severe cramping lasting more than two or three hours. And when I speak about severe, I mean the type of severity that makes you say, I need to go to the emergency room. We all have the potential for that problem based on lots of medical things, um, and, and it's no different with an individual with an ostomy. We put on here a deep cut in the stoma. Now, in all my years um, as a wound ostomy continence nurse, I've never really seen a deep cut in the stoma. I think this is here because, of course, individuals with ostomies can jump out of airplanes, they can go hiking, they can do the Himalayas, they can do a lot of things that might put them in a place where they may bang up and, and, and injure their stoma or traumatic, tra traumatize their stoma. I've had young football players. So if, that, if something happened from trauma um, and there was a lot of bleeding, but the average individual in assisted living physician, facility is not going to come up against that. Excessive bleeding from the stoma opening. Now, excessive bleeding, I don't mean just a little bit of red when you wipe the stoma, which would be normal because remember that muco mucosal surface is like the inside of your mouth. You know, when you brush your teeth and you bang your gums up against your toothbrush and you get a little bleeding, that's, uh, you know, minimal bleeding that would also be expected if you um, wiped your stoma off and had a little bit of blood. But excessive bleeding is a different story. and Think of this, you could have an ulcer in your stomach and have bleeding from your stomach or be on blood thinners and have irritation in your bowel and that would ca cause some bleeding. If you were did not have an ostomy, it would be coming out your rectum. But people with an ostomy, it comes out their ostomy. It is no different, but again, it needs assessment by their primary care physician or the emergency room. Continuous bleeding at the junction of the stoma and skin. Now this is highly unlikely. There are certain physiological um, conditions in which you might have a very vascular surface right next to the stoma on the skin that might bleed easily. This is not um, an average condition. Um, it's a little varicosities near the uh, stoma that sometimes occur in certain disease processes. Um, if that occurred, then that's an individual that would need to be seen uh, in the emergency room, but that is not your standard average kind of problem. Severe skin irritations or deep ulcerations. This occurs uh, occasionally to patients with ostomies, and it may be due to 
For example, being on antibiotics, it changes the flora of the skin and the skin can get a yeast infection. And um, if it's uh, 90 degrees out in the summer and the skin is kind of yeasty and has a rash, um, the pouching system may irritate the skin and then they can get kind of a moist rash. Um, that is not something that happens all the time. We teach our patients in, when they are learning ostomy care to be on the lookout for this and how to um, treat this at home without a problem. But it, it, there are circumstances where perhaps someone's pouch would not be staying on as well as they had previously and they would say, geez, there's something wrong. And they would need to be followed up by their provider or their wound ostomy continence nurse for treatment for that. Um, unusual changes in stoma size and appearance can happen over time, and, it, and a patient certainly would know uh, if there was a, a specific change that didn't look normal. If someone happened to be in a um, facility that was assisted living that went to like a memory care unit, um, the staff would certainly recognize that there it was a particular uh, oddness that wasn't um, apparent previously and seek primary care consulting. Watery discharge that lasts more than five hours for an ileostomy, a colostomy. And when, when we say watery, we, we mean watery, uh, you know, water colored stool that lasts a long time. That could be an indication of a GI bug or something of that nature. And as in anyone else who might be getting a GI flu after five or six hours of continuous stooling and you're feeling kind of faint, you pretty much feel like you need to call the doctor or uh, get some sort of help. Um, either medication or in, in the case of an ileostomy, perhaps they would need hydration and, and a trip to the emergency room. Continuous nausea of vomiting, again, um, we all would not want to experience that. And if it went on for any length of time, we would certainly seek um, a consult from our primary physicians. And an ostomy, specifically an ileostomy or a urostomy that does not have any output at all, zero, for four to six hours and is accompanied by distress, um, these things would need probably an assessment by a uh, medical facility. So these are things that ostomates would seek medical assistance for. And most of them on this list are the same things that if it happened to you or I, who, who are not have uh, diverted with an ostomy would also seek medical assistance for. So we just wanted to make sure that we were clear about what's the ordinary and what's the inordinary. Next slide, please. Okay, hi, back to me. Um, assessments of needs is the critical first step in the design of an individual service plan. P and I think that you're going to find that people seeking as assisted living admission range from the totally independent person who seeks environmental support to people who don't know what they need but know that they're doing what they're doing isn't working. In between are people who can direct their care but need physical assistance and people who need reminders and supervision but no physical assistance. People with ostomies fall into, into all these categories. The challenge is to figure out what assistance is needed and who is going to do it. Change the slide, please. This is what you need to know about self-management of ostomy care. One of the components is pouch emptying. This is a daily activity. So you want to see, does the person understand when to empty the pouch and remember to empty it? Can they open and empty, then clean the end and reseal it? And then we run into the, the, the um, activities that are going to sound very familiar because they're toileting assistance. Can the person get to the bathroom? Can they transfer? Can they adjust their clothing? Additionally, with a urostomy, the person has to be able to attach and detach the night drainage bag and keep it clean. Change the slide, please.
The next component of ostomy management is appliance change. This is done every three to seven days and as needed. You want to know if the person understands when to change an, an appliance and can they maintain a schedule. Can they gather the supplies needed to, to make the appliance change? Can they prepare the pouch? Can they clean the skin? Can they apply a new pouch? Can they dispose of the used pouch? Do they know how to inspect the skin around the stoma and recognize any minor skin issues and know how to manage them? Do they know the difference between a minor skin issue and something that needs medical attention? Next slide, please. Ostomy supply management. These activities fall more under the instrumental activities of daily living. And usually setting up supplies is a one-time thing. Arrangements made with a supplier are made with a supplier. Um, they're given all the information, they check the insurance, and then they are delivered monthly. A lot of times um, these things can be done with online programs now. Um, and they can be set up um, on a regular basis. Um, as you can see, ostomy care is not complex and falls into the ADL and IADL categories. Understanding the participation level of the person with an ostomy in their ostomy care will facilitate writing the ISP. Next slide, please, and Kate will pick it up. So our, our final thoughts, you know, as we look at this, we have a couple of final thoughts and then some resources for you. Um, luckily in the state of Pennsylvania, you um, are have the ability to either bring in or hire uh, a, um, or the patient can bring in um, private help. Um, in some states, that's not as easily done. In assisted living, we have found out. And also the fact that in assisted living in Pennsylvania, you can bring in um, you know, home health nursing to assist with any educational needs or troubleshooting to help your staff if, if your staff does not have that level of comfort with an individual who, who might be coming back home or who may be accepted into your assisted living who might have an ostomy. You can bring value to your facility by understanding the difference between simplistic and regular care with um, proper education and any kind of uh, complexities that may occur with patients with ostomies that would just need um, referral actually back to their providers or their, or their wound ostomy continence nurses or their surgeons. So you can bring value to your facility by understanding that concept uh, much more. We want ostomy, people with ostomies to be welcome and treated in any potential assisted living, to be able to stay at their home and not be separated by their partners or spouses and to be able to age in place, which I think is the focus of the future um, for certain in this country. Next slide, please. We have provided, um, uh, this is a small list, but actually within each one of these bullets is, um, quite a lot of information. I'm going to speak to a couple of them here. The Wound Ostomy and Continence Nursing Society, as Janine explained, is um, our membership, our Wound Ostomy Continence Nurses from across the country. Um, and there's information on the website about the types of services that we can provide, as well as educational um, elements uh, for both uh, administrators as well as staff people um, that might be on this call. The online skin assessment tool, which you can see the connection here on the web, is a comprehensive pictorial tool that looks at the ostomy patient and what kinds of items might happen to someone's peristomal skin, um, how they look, and what the subsequent treatment may be. Um, it is based, um, uh, there's a clinical tool and there's a patient-oriented tool. So there's actually two different skin assessments there. I've put up the link for the consumer. There's also a clinician tool. 
So that may be helpful for both your staff and um, very helpful at a beginner level for the patients themselves that may be in your facilities or for those who don't have um, skilled staff on service, um, the consumer tool is very helpful. And to contact us um, for more information, you can specifically for uh, myself and on the Wound Osme Continents nursing organization, the info at wocn.org. If you reach out there, you will get an individual who will respond to your needs. And Sue, you would like to talk to the other resources? Yeah, the, U, the United Ostomy Associations of America website is a wonderful resource both for people with ostomies and caregivers. It has tools and checklists, guides for each type of ostomy, and information about eating with an ostomy, about maintaining hydration, and it, and it can be used for both the patients and, the, and your staff education. Um, it is just a wealth of information. Um, also, specifically for assisted living, the frequently asked question guide can be found on the website too. Um, so we would like to thank you for inviting us to share our information at your webinar, and we would now like to answer any questions you have. Thank you, ladies, for sharing this information with us today. Um, like I said, we are open to questions now, so if you do have any questions, please type them in the question box on the right hand of your, of your screen. And we'll just give it a couple minutes. Um, don't forget, while we have while we're waiting for questions to come in, I want to remind everyone to check our website for upcoming webinars. We do have more webinars coming up in the next uh, couple weeks, and we are planning into the month of March. If there are any topics that you want us to explore, please uh, put that information into the follow up survey after the the webinar and we'll be happy to look at those um, as we're scheduling through the remainder of the year. We also have our assisted living and personal care home summit coming up on March 22nd and that's going to be at Spooky Nook down in the Lancaster County area. So again, check our website registration is open and we are taking uh, precautions uh, for COVID, so um, just check that out, read the terms and conditions so that you're aware of um, how we're handling uh, safety for that in-person event. All right, this is, you must have covered everything really well. There aren't any questions um, at the moment, but we'll give it a little bit more time. Give it another minute or so. And I will be following up. We'll have the contact information for Janine. So if anyone does have any questions, um, you know, later or any situations that you would want to run by um, any of the ladies, we'll have their contact information in the follow-up email that I'll be getting out later today. All right. Looks like looks like you did a great job covering everything, ladies. We don't have any questions at the moment, but like I said, I will be following up and we'll have Janine's contact information. So if you have any, um, again, any questions or situations that you would like to run by um, any of our presenters today, um, Janine will be sure to get you in touch with them. So we'll wrap up now. Um, again, stay on to complete the survey, please. Uh, today's webinar recording will be made available on the PHCA website. Be sure to check out more of our uh, webinars, like I said, that are coming up that have been scheduled through March currently, um, and we're looking to schedule into the spring now. So if there are any topics, please, again, add those to your uh, the information in the survey. Again, I want to thank Janine, Susan, and Kate for today's presentation. Thank you, ladies. It was very thorough and a lot of good resources here for everyone. Uh, I want to wish everybody a great remainder to your day and stay well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.